Welcome back to my video series on complex variables. Today's lecture is going to be about Laurent series, after which we'll transition into a really important topic called the Residue Theorem. You can think of a Laurent series as a more generalized Taylor series, particularly one that's used in expanding out complex functions. In fact, a couple of complex variables books that I've seen group the two together in the same chapter. Now, just as there's a Taylor's theorem for real functions, there's a Laurent's theorem for complex functions. I won't prove it to you, but here's what it says. Say I have two concentric circles in the complex plane. C1 is the inner circle, C2 is the outer one. These circles don't necessarily have to be finite. One could be infinitely small, just covering a single point, while the other could be infinitely large. It doesn't matter. I'll label the region between these two circles as R. Suppose I have a function f of z that's holomorphic in R. Suppose also that I have a point z0 at the center of the inner circle, so not in the region where the function f is necessarily holomorphic. What Laurent's theorem says is that I can expand f of z as a Laurent series around z0, and this Laurent series is composed of z minus z0 in positive powers and z minus z0 in negative powers. With Taylor series, you only have the polynomial part whenever you expanded a real function around some point. With Laurent series, however, you also have the rational part, or the part with the negative powers. This portion, the one with negative powers, is also called the principal part of the Laurent series, while the polynomial part is called the analytic part of the Laurent series. This principal part is significant because it allows Laurent series to do something Taylor series can't, because if I plug z0 into my equation for f of z, then provided that all these b coefficients aren't zero, my f of z, because of the z minus z0 in the denominator, will be undefined at z equals z0. That means I'm capable of capturing isolated singularities in the Laurent series of a complex function. And this is what separates a Laurent series from a Taylor series, because for a Taylor series, you only got a polynomial and you could only center that polynomial around a point where the function was continuous and differentiable. With Laurent series, however, you can expand around that point where the function isn't defined, or a singularity. Now with Taylor series, it was possible to find the coefficients of a Taylor series by finding the derivatives of the function at the point you were expanding around. But for Laurent series, it's a bit different, because instead of derivatives, you now have to use contour integrals to find the series coefficients. For the coefficients in the A series or the series corresponding to the polynomial part of the Laurent series, the formula looks something like this. While for the B series or the principal part of the Laurent series, the formula looks something like this. Note that in these integrals, C is just a closed curve inside R that's around Z0. Now let's suppose that I have a complex plane with a function f of z that exists over that complex plane and a point z0 within that plane at which f of z is singular, where it's undefined. Let's say I surround this point with a circle c1, so that z0 is the only singular point within the circle c1. By Laurent's theorem, I can write f of z as a Laurent series around the singularity z0. The nature of the Laurent series I write is related to the nature of the singularity at z0. So for instance, if my entire principal part, or the b series, is zero, then f of z is analytic at z equals z0. In contrast, if all infinite b series coefficients are non-zero, then f of z is said to have an essential singularity or an essential pole at z0. On the other hand, if only the first n b series coefficients are non-zero, while all the b series coefficients above the index n are zero, then z0 is said to be a pole of order n. A pole of order one has a special name, it's called a simple pole. Similarly, if the entire principal part of the Laurent series is zero, and all a's below a n are zero, then z0 is a zero of order n. Finally, and this is probably the most important definition out of all the ones mentioned so far, the coefficient b1 in the principal part of the Laurent series expansion around z0 is called the residue of f of z at z0. So that would mean this b1 over here. Let's look at a simple example to illustrate these points. Suppose we have a complex function given by sine z over z squared. Well, we can recall that the Taylor expansion of sine is x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the 5 over 5 factorial and so on. 
In that case, we can deduce that the Laurent expansion of sine z over z squared is just the Taylor expansion in terms of z divided by z squared. Thus, f of z is 1 over z plus z over 3 factorial plus z cubed over 5 factorial and so on. In this case, we can see that f of z has a simple pole at z not equals 0 because there's no terms that contain 1 over z squared or 1 over z cubed or any terms that have higher negative powers of z. We can also see that the residue of f of z at z not equals 0 is just 1 because the coefficient of 1 over z is just 1. Another example is a more complicated rational function. I won't write the Laurent series for this because it would take really long, but I will note a couple of important things. One is that there's three singular points here, one at z equals 8, another at z equals 2, and the third at z equals negative 1. Another thing to note is that z equals 8 is a pole of order 2, z equals 2 is a pole of order 1, and z equals negative 1 is a pole of order 3. How I determine the order of these poles was by looking at the exponent next to the terms corresponding to the singularities in the denominator. Because you can imagine that if we try to expand out this rational function as a Laurent series, say if we expand around z equals negative 1, we won't find a term that's, you know, 1 over z plus 1 to the power 4. You can see why, because it only goes up to z plus 1 cubed. So hopefully you can understand what I mean when I associate the orders of these poles with the function that I'm given. Now you might wonder why I keep calling these singularities poles. The reason's pretty simple, but interesting. If I draw a surface plot of the magnitude of f of z over the complex plane, let's take the second example here, then over the points of singularity, f of z's magnitude is going to approach infinity, so the surface will look like it has a huge spike in it at the point of the singularity. Since this spike looks like a pole, people decided to call the singularity a pole. I'm going to end this video here. In the next video, we're going to move on to what is probably the most important topic in complex variables, and that's the residue theorem.